has been to focus on the kind of most dominant uh, actors with, with in this space and how they make money and how they act and how their actions shape Twitch as quite a thing. And of these two million, million people who broadcast on Twitch, somewhere in the range of a few hundred thousand make some money from it, but not much. Um, somewhere between 5,000 and 25,000 make enough money to have a kind of part-time job on Twitch and they have some other a part-time job to to, uh, to make up the rest, and somewhere between three and five thousand thousands of people now make a full-time living by broadcasting themselves playing games online and by encouraging the people who view them to give them money as a kind of altruistic donation in exchange for the content which they make. And one crucial thing to stress here is that watching someone on Twitch is free. So you can watch hours and hours and years and years of content and never pay someone and yet thousands of people make a full-time living on Twitch. Does anyone know how much money the most successful Twitch streamer made last year? It's a very large number. It's about one and a half million uh, dollars. Uh, this guy made just by broadcasting himself, playing games on this platform, and being so skilled at encouraging people to give him money for this that he made that much money. Uh, this year, the most successful streamer now, a guy called Ninja, is on track to make about five million dollars this year on Twitch. Most pros make far less than that. Most make kind of normal, kind of middling five-figure uh, incomes. But maybe a thousand of those five thousand make six-figure incomes, and maybe kind of ten make seven-figure incomes. So this is what Twitch looks like. So the so the main thing is uh, you have a screen where a game is shown, and then you have the webcam of the person uh, playing. This thing here is called Twitch chat, which is where uh, uh, viewers can talk live with, with each other and also talk to the streamer. And if the streamer sees a viewer say something which, which they want to respond to, then the streamer will say something back. But say with voice rather than say with uh, typing. And uh, down here, Twitch will say uh, games and channels which it thinks you might want to watch, rather like Netflix. And up there, you can uh, follow the streamer and view their past broadcasts and things of this sort. And uh, this, this full broadcast lasted uh, 4 hours and 17 minutes, which is quite short compared to lots of the broadcasts that, that, uh, that lots of streamers do. So uh, when Twitch first came out, it was focused on what's called uh, eSports, which is where, which is the kind of professionalized competitive play of games, where the world's best uh, game players play each other for lots of money. The prizes can be quite big these days, the uh, biggest event uh, last year gave out, I think, about $12 million in prize money to the world's most skilled video game uh, players. And last year, roughly $100 mil in uh, total prize money was given uh, to these players. And this year, it will be more like 150 or 160 or so. And there are lots of, and there are maybe three to three, three to 400 people on Earth who make a full-time job playing on these things. But millions of, of, uh, of people watch this. And the esports sector as a whole is thought to be worth some in range of three quarters of a billion. And Twitch was vital to the growth of esports since it allowed people who weren't there in person to watch these sorts of contests. But these days, most people who broadcast on Twitch, as in 99.9999 of those who broadcast on Twitch, are not esports players. These are people who have no uh, background in most cases in TV or radio or broadcasting in general, and things of this sort. Um, and they range from people who just stream from their bedrooms with a basic webcam and they stream just to three friends, to people, like I say, who can make high seven-figure incomes and who broadcast to hundreds of thousands of people at once, and millions of people um, over, a, over a full uh, year. And like I say, few of these people have backgrounds in fields which you think that they might. But for, but for a lot of young, kind of tech-savvy uh, people, this is a kind of increasingly appealing path when more traditional ed 
educational or employment options might not seem to might not seem to work out. So this has been the kind of focus of my work for the last three years ish. Uh, I've interviewed about 120 uh, pro Twitch streamers, i.e., people who make a full time living by getting people to give them money for the content which they make on Twitch, uh, which I think is the largest body of Twitch streamers anyone's talked to so far, I think. And also, if there's a lot of sort of um, ethno kind of graphic work here too, both uh, online and offline, in the UK, the US, Germany, Poland, and Brazil, and this year I hope to have like China and South Korea, maybe. And the, uh, and the kind of goals here have been to make sense of A, who streams on Twitch and why, and who and what kinds of backgrounds do, do, these, do these people come from, how do they master the technological uh, aspects of this, how does the platform itself shape what they broadcast, and what's the kind of labour of being a pro slash someone who wants to be a pro Twitch streamer. And then also kind of why do people watch, watch this, <coughs> I, why would people choose to watch someone else playing a game rather than going to play the game themselves, or going to watch TV or, or, or film or things of uh, this sort. And then in, in a kind of broader sense, what does this tell us about gaming and kind of modern streaming uh, live technology in general? So to make a job out of streaming, you have to work extremely hard, and most streamers even when their full-time job might be elsewhere, but they stream just for leisure, they might stream five or six or seven hours every day, and if it's your full-time job or your part-time job, this climbs up to eight or nine or ten, and some people will stream every day of the week, including weekends, and some people do these things called streaming challenges, where they will, say, promise to stream every day without break for two years, and they will do this, in most cases, and that's a very successful way to build one stream and to get viewers in and to keep view, viewers kind of locked into your channel once they first come on, which I'll talk more, more through, in, through in a bit. And um, others will do things like they will stream non-stop for, for 24 hours or for 48 hours on some extreme cases for 72 hours without taking a break or sleeping, so they will just broadcast games for that whole time. Um, and this has led to some kind of intriguing uh, outcomes where there was one uh, streamer who was very well known for streaming in, in three-day blocks. And that's kind of what made him famous and what brought in his uh, income. And then one day he basically had a kind of breakdown on stream and said, I've been taking speed and that's the only reason I've been able to stream for three-day blocks without a gap. And so these are the kinds of extreme things which people uh, have to do slash feel that they have to do, which is kind of the same thing, but kind of not, uh, when they want to try to make it on this kind of platform. Um, but lots of the work also takes, takes place off screen. So streamers talk a lot about how for every hour they spend on stream, every hour they spend live, they spend roughly one hour off stream doing things like choosing what game to play, doing things like uh, all the kind of setup for the stream and the webcam and the uh, uploads and so on, and also uh, talking on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Discord and Slack and things of this sort, and also uh, admin tasks, um, as lots of streamers have sponsorships from big companies now, and lots of their off-stream work is spent dealing with these sorts of things. And in the last year, we've seen the growth of this, of this new job where some people are employed solely to, to manage this admin stuff for live streamers. So they are professional live streamer managers now, and that's all they do, that's all they make money from. Um, and they will have, say, 10 or 12 clients, and with these people, they deal with all the kind of uh, sponsors and, and, uh, so, and kind of the social uh, branding stuff and things of this sort. And all of these change a broadcast from person in bedroom with webcam into quite a kind of slick thing with sounds and graphics and uh, overlays and things of this sort. But, uh, where, but whereas for eSports players, if you want to have success in that space, you have to be extremely skilled. On Twitch, it's far more crucial to be friendly and to be fun and to be witty and to be kind of engaging to uh, viewers. And the idea here is to build up this sense that when you watch, you are not viewing a stranger who lives X miles away. You are, you are just kind of chilling out with a friend and playing, and playing games. I'll date a friend who encourages you to give them money, um, and a friend who, who, who you've never met in person, 
and who wouldn't recognize you in person and who doesn't know your real name, but still a friend, nevertheless. Um, and lots of streamers now do these things where uh, off stream they will think of jokes or think of comments, and then when they go live, they, they will pass these off as being things which they just thought of like that. And this is very, very close, of course, to how live TV works, where in the stricter sense, yes, the broadcast is live, but there's a huge volume of non-live stuff which goes into making this thing live, of course. Um, and streamers also, and here we kind of begin to see, like, why do, why do viewers stay engaged in these sorts of uh, spaces? Streamers work hard to build up the sense that everyone who views their stream is part of one kind of culture or one kind of community of uh, viewers and the streamer, and where the viewers are not seen as being kind of beneath the streamer, but where everyone is part of one kind of shared uh, space. And lots of streamers come up with names for the groups of people who watch them. And, and both for women and for men streamers, these names tend to be very kind of strong, tough male names, like the Wolfpack or the Core. And these are the names for the group of fans which, which a streamer has. And fans seem to really kind of strongly adopt these sorts of identities to, uh, for them. And lots of streamers will build in whole kind of lines of uh, t-shirts and mugs and mouse masks and so on based on their branding of them and their fans for their fans to buy. And more than once, just on trains and planes and in the street and so on, I have seen people wearing t-shirts and things from live streamers who I know based on how successful their brand is both on the site and in these kinds of merch things. Uh, and so so like I say, kind of streamers also have to build up this sense that they are the viewer's friend. And part of this is this sense that the viewer knows them more than you maybe know the kind of average person on, say, uh, Twitter. And so streamers are very kind of honest about their real names and where they live and their pets and their partners and they will share if they, if they get ill or if a parent or some other loved one is ill and things of this sort. And viewers share this back, and this builds up this real kind of sense that these are spaces where everyone involved is there, at least in part, to support each other through life in some sense. Um, and this is what streamers try to build up, that if you feel down, if you feel sad, then this is somewhere to come and both A, watch content which will be fun and uh, worth viewing, but also to talk with people who are your friends in some sense, who've shared things with you and you share this, and you share things with them and so on. And it's striking how uh, commonly you see viewers saying things like, um, I've had a really tough year, I thought of killing myself, but viewing your stream has kept me alive. And that's super common, uh, and that happens a lot, and there are lots and lots of people who frame these streams as kind of vital parts of their kind of mental health. Um, but for streamers, this leads to a weird kind of um, thing which happens when they meet a viewer in person. From the streamer's point of view, they've never, they have never seen this, this person ever. From the viewer's point of view, they are best friends, and they are great friends, and they know that, that their pets sister got injured or something, and so the streamer will see a total stranger come up to them and say, hey Jane, it's so great to, to meet you, how's John's uh, arm going or something? And for the, for the streamers, there's this really kind of sharp uh, kind of tension between they have to share a lot of themselves here, but when they do this, the viewers who have had all, all of this to share with them then act in these, in, in these kinds of very uh, intimate sorts of ways, which the streamers really, uh, really kind of struggle with. And so, and so Twitch as a whole is, is creating this new kind of class of digital celebrities who are far easier to access than those on Twitter or YouTube or Instagram or things of this sort. And this in, and this in part is because people who are successful on those other platforms make money in ways which don't necessarily need the viewer to directly give, whereas you have to on Twitch. 
and, and also since Twitch is live and we can speak with the streamer, it seems to be, from the viewer's point of view, a far kind of closer link to this person than on Twitch, than on uh, Twitter and things of this sort. And so, for lots of people, especially in the kind of bigger Twitch channels, the chance to talk to someone who is this kind of well-known digital celebrity in some sense is part of the appeal of these sorts of sites. And as I showed prior, when these are people who are sponsored by, say, Sony, or who have a deal with Microsoft, or who show up on, uh, on live TV or major um, events and things of this sort, for the viewer's point of view, these are real, the kind of big, crucial online uh, influences, I guess. And also, as part of this, the kind of era where, where gaming is slash was seen as a kind of straight cis white male hobby has changed completely. And there are lots of people on Twitch who've built these kind of uh, safe spaces for people who aren't straight cis white men. And um, in lots of these cases, a big part of the appeal for viewers is, a, is kind of access to gamers who are like them rather, rather than the kind of gamer uh, cliche. But in lots of these cases, there's this kind of intriguing split between how these spaces market themselves to fans and viewers and how they try to make money from these sorts of, sorts of uh, spaces. So to use one case here, there's a streamer whose username used to be 8-bit homo and he had a very kind of LGBTQ friendly space and he built a huge stream and clearly he used the term homo as a kind of joking term in, the, in this context. But he found that no sponsors were willing to sponsor his stream with the word homo in his name and yet that was why loads of people liked viewing his stream and, and felt that it was a, a kind of safe, uh, inclusive space. And so he, he changed his name to Avid Dylan, which was his real name, but, and that brought in more money, but lots of his fans felt that he'd sold out and was no longer this kind of safe, non-straight gamer uh, space, which he built his fan base on. Now, this slide is especially weird, so I need some water before I talk about this. <laughs> so, although in general, if a streamer wants to do well, like I said, they need to tell you a lot about who they are in the real world, a few streamers don't do this. So some stream as basically characters, and there's three kind of levels to this. So some will stream as who they are in the real world, but a kind, a kind of louder, more fun, more exciting version of who they are in the real world. And this is what they say, this is not me uh, saying this. But some will create entire alter egos and then live stream themselves playing games as these people. And one of these is the, is the Twitch pilot, who is this guy. And whenever he streams, he talks like a pilot. Everything on his stream is branded to be cannons and ships and treasure chests and so forth. And when I asked this guy, so why do you stream as a pilot? He said, well, no one else was doing this. As if that just, <laughs> as if that just explained it all perfectly. Um, and, so lots of, and so lots of people kind of create these people who are not who they are in the real world and so on, but this is a way to stand out from two billion other uh, people who broadly speaking stream as who they are in the, in the real world. And then the third group there are people who stream as kind of well-known pop culture uh, figures, so they will, will stream as say uh, Batman or someone from Game of Thrones or things of this sort, and in the kind of mild case they stream as their real self but, but dressed up as this person, or in the extreme case, they will kind of play a game as they imagine the character from Game of Thrones who they're dressed up as would play that game like, which makes no sense as there are no video games in the Game of Thrones world, but this is what they do nevertheless. Um, and so, like, I think here it's worth saying that kind of in most sort of work on how people are, are successful on social media uh, platforms, in general, the idea of authenticity is vital. And yes, it is vital on Twitch for say 99 or 98% uh, of those who stream on the site. But also, if the streamer in, kind of in, question, in question would rather deal with this idea of consistency rather than an idea of 
authenticity, they can stream as just a mega figure as long as they always stay as stay as that as that figure. They never they never kind of drop the act. And the and the Twitch pirate also talks like a pirate on Twitter. Of course he does. And as long as you never drop these things, this works just as well on Twitch as streaming as your real self. And for the few people who do this, it seems to be a way to kind of stop the, the platform from creeping into your real life. To split up who you are on stream and who you are off stream, and to deal with that kind of weird break of making your money on a site which, in general, requires you to show a huge volume of who you are. So also, a part of why people like to watch Twitch and watch this kind of content is to see what games they might then themselves want to buy. And games reviewing up until the last 10 years has been fairly kind of fixed since 1970s, 1980s-ish, where you would get a game gets sent to a journalist and they, and they play it through and so on, and then if it's a text review, they write a thousand words on that game and they put in a few screenshots and things, and that's it. If it's a, if it's a vid, the old review, which is kind of newer in the last 15 years-ish, then they would record, say, 6 to 10 minutes of game footage, and they talk over that, uh, that uh, footage, and they would make sure that the footage shows nothing vital about the game. So if there's a huge plot twist at the halfway point, then they wouldn't show that, of course. Um, and so both, both of these reviewing styles are very much like kind of high likes reels, where the game's journalist chooses what in this game is of, is of interest to show or to write about. However, uh, on Twitch, Twitch has kind of com has completely transformed how games are reviewed, and to a small extent how film and TV are too, but, but that's a side topic, um, in the last five to ten years, in that as soon as a game comes out, Lots and lots of streamers will jump on that game and play that game for a day or two or three. And this is a way to build their viewer base by playing games which are new and fresh and which people want to watch at this second. But as part of this, this means viewers can, if they want to, watch, watch the entire game just being played live by someone on Twitch. And they can ask the streamer, hey, how's this game playing? Do you like it? Is it hard? Is it easy? How are the controls? And things of this sort. And the kind of critique which a streamer gives is more of a kind of stream of uh, consciousness than it would be in the older style of games reviews, where the, where the reviewer plays it and then goes off, sits down and plans out what they want to say. And like I say there, if you watch for enough time, you will see the, the whole game being played, and you will see any spoiler, any shock, any surprise, any boss, any secrets, and so on and so forth. And so Twitch, so one of the big reasons now why uh, gamers watch Twitch is this kind of transformation of how games we use work on a platform which is live which is not done by pros, and where you can talk directly to the person who, who is playing and think through this kind of game. So this, broadly speaking, is kind of the gap between the older, older model and the newer model of how these sorts, sorts, sorts of things work. And I should say, although the old model does still exist and people still read these things, games journalism has been on a pretty sharp downward uh, path in terms of money, in terms of viewers, in terms of jobs for the last 10 to 15 years, and Twitch has just sped that up when so much of the game reviewer's job is now just on live by random people from their bedrooms. And so um, streamers now, and this is one of the big reasons why games companies are increasingly choosing to sponsor streamers, is that they now act to in purchase uh, choices for gamers who watch their uh, kind of channels. And so some games companies have responded by trying to ban their games being played live on Twitch because they feel, oh, it's just like if they were playing, if they were being <laughs> filmed on Twitch, 
then everyone can just view that film for free. But games, of course, are not quite like films in that if in that if it's a game with many different uh, options and plot lines and so on, then in one playthrough you only see one, and if there's ten or twenty or ten thousand, then you only see one kind of portion of that game. And in general, most games companies now seem to feel that encouraging Twitch streamers to play their games will bring in more more money than than saying no, you can't. It's a uh, secret. But this uh, final point here is that for lots of streamers, this this ties ties into a a kind of tricky uh, tension around the idea of them as non-professional content uh, me. In that most streamers build themselves as being kind of just a gamer like you, the viewer, and you just hang out and you play games and so on. But when you would hang out with a friend and play games, your friend generally isn't sponsored to play games with you in their house, and yet here they are. And so streamers have to kind of work hard to keep this sense that they are just kind of normal, everyday people who you are friends with and who you hang out with. But they also happen to have a good friend at Microsoft who gives them all these free games and pays them thousands of dollars to play these games live. So also uh, crucial to kind of making sense of why of why people watch other people playing games is Twitch chat. So this, like I said at the start, is a live chat window which scrolls uh, uh, which scrolls up on the right hand side of a Twitch broadcast, and uh, mm -hmm. this has a kind of one second lag or something, so in essence it's live for viewers to, to say things to viewers, viewers to, to say things to the streamer, and viewers just to kind of fire comments into the void. And as you can see from this GIF, Twitch chat is a site of very sophisticated, mature, <laughs> erudite discussion of the uh, topics and issues of the, of the present day, uh, or it's mostly swearing, memes, insulting comments or questions towards the streamer about why they aren't doing what that viewer would like them to be doing. Um, and some streamers are very strict on what, on, what, on what viewers can say in their chat window. Twitch as a platform are very hands-off and basically say you can choose what kind of stuff you allow into your stream. So in some streams this kind of garbage would just be banned, in some streams it's fine, um, in some streams you some streamers, uh, there's, there's a small kind of clique of uh, alt-right streamers who pride themselves on, on free speech and on kind of banning nothing in their chats and things of this sort. But broadly speaking, in most channels, if you say some racist, sexist, etc. slur, then you'll be banned. Outside of that, broadly speaking, you can say whatever you'd like to say. Um, and this allows, like I say, kind of viewers to talk to this to, to talk to the streamer like that. If the streamer has say half a million people watching them at once, it's kind of tough for one person's message to be seen, as the Twitch chat will just zoom up at say a thousand texts every second, and it's kind of hard to see stuff on that. But in a small uh, channel, this is a crucial part of building this sense that the viewers know the streamer and are part of this kind of single broader uh, culture. And a crucial part of this is that uh, kind of social status within Twitch chat is tied to these little icons here uh, by the name of a viewer. And in essence, the more money that you as a viewer give to the streamer, the better your icons are. And social status comes down to icons on this platform, and so people will give lots of money to, to streamers. Um, and I think it's kind of intriguing to look here at how viewers aspire to be mods. So for, for, so for those who have not seen this kind of things, uh, on Twitch there are viewers in, in every channel who are moderators, and their jobs, like a lot of online uh, spaces, is to basically kind of act as a sort of middle person between the platform owners and the viewers slash users. And on Twitch, a mod, which, which is that little uh, icon there, they do four big things. They, uh, they are viewers who are tasked with, with removing things in chat which the streamer wouldn't like, 
or banning people who the streamer would want banned. They are tasked with kind of giving out uh, info about a channel. So if someone new comes in and types, hey, what's the stream on? The streamer will not respond, but a mod who's just a normal viewer will say, hey, welcome to our stream. We stream uh, on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays from 6 to 10, and we stream League of Legends or something. Um, and they also help out the streamer with uh, admin, so they do things like converting Twitch videos into YouTube videos, and they also, like I say, have a lot of uh, prestige within the Twitch chat uh, windows. But, whereas streamers, like I say, can make up to five million dollars per year from streaming, mods are not paid at all, and yet all, and yet a huge volume of viewers aspire to take on this unpaid work on the part of these all of the streamers slash friend who they watch on Twitch. Um, and <clears throat> the streamers who are talked with all stress that they that they could not have a successful channel on Twitch without mods. And then I say, oh so do you pay them? And they go, ha, of course not. And I I have yet to find a single streamer who pays their mods anything. I mean, mods will go so far as to reschedule their own lives to make sure they are on when the streamer is on so that they can act as a mod in their channel. Uh, and streamers will even reward good mods with extra unpaid labour. And the mods are very happy with this as far as one can tell and seem very pleased to be in essence paid in social status within Twitch chat rather than through money and so on. Um, and to go back also just briefly to these to these points, um, when so much of what makes a Twitch community comes down to how central the viewer feels as part of that space, by giving mods work, the idea is to make them feel part of the whole broadcast and, and part of the whole channel rather than just a random viewer who just happens to watch. But the unpaid labour of mods and of viewers who aren't mods but who aspire to be so goes even uh, further. So if you are a mod in Joe Bloggs' channel and you are well known in that channel and you have high status in that channel, if you on your leisure time just go to someone else's channel and say something nasty, Joe Bloggs feels that that re reflects badly on him and might then ban you from being a mod in his channel. So even when you watch, watch Twitch purely as a kind of leisure, if you are a mod in someone else's channel, you as a viewer are basically expected to behave yourself based on how that streamer, who pays you nothing, expects you to act within their own channel. Uh, and mods again seem kind of okay with this and seem to think, yeah, that's fair, that's fine. Um, I think that their ideas of these things have been warped somewhat from their time on this platform, but they have been led to feel like they are such a key part of a streamer's channel that they want to keep up their social standing on that channel by avoiding doing anything even kind of slightly uh, shady on someone else's channel. So to sum up this point, to do well on Twitch requires you to kind of bring viewers into the kind of labour which you have to do to run a Twitch channel and due to how Twitch is, is built where the viewers who, who do the most labour rather than the most leisure on behalf of the Twitch streamer are those who are seen as the best viewers and the closest viewers and the closest friends of the Twitch streamer. Excuse me. Viewers are very keen to do this. Um, and, like, and, like, and like I say, mods and, and other viewers frame what they do to help a streamer as just helping out a friend rather than giving money to some random person who lives on the other side of the world. So there's this weird kind of uh, ecosystem here between the um, affordances of Twitch as a platform and how, social, and how social status works on Twitch and what pro streamers have to do slash choose to do if they want to do well and make money and maybe and, and maybe one day have a job on Twitch. So now let's talk about money. So here's a gif of someone playing Mega Man and being given $1,200 just as a random donation because someone was enjoying watching and playing this game. And I should add, about one minute after this, someone else 
donated $1,235 because they couldn't bear someone else to have given that streamer the most money on that day. And when you have this framing where you can, you can get people to compete giving $1,000 amounts for a service which is free, there's something quite intriguing going on here which I think is worth um, exploring. And just on a side note here, this guy is shirtless here. Um, on Twitch, the rule used to be that if you were a guy, you could be shirtless, and if you were a woman, you had to wear a bra, but that's all. But Twitch changed that about a year back because they wanted to mark out that Twitch is not a kind of cam platform. Uh, so now you always have to wear at least a vest or shirt on Twitch. Um, and Twitch have not released why this was, but like I say, it, it's quite clear that kind of a lot of people who make money on cam girl sites and things of this sort also stream on Twitch. And so Twitch wanted to kind of break up the idea that sex sells on Twitch in any kind of way. And the men like this guy who were, who would stream shirtless tended to be very young and very fit, and that's why the, and that's why they would stream with, with, with uh, without a shirt on. Anyway, there are no ads. Sorry, there are no ads. Ah, great point. Um, you can run adverts on Twitch. However, uh, you can also switch them off. And the Twitch streamers who switch them off tend to frame this as this kind of really nice thing they've done for their viewers. So their viewers should probably make up for it by giving them some more money to make up for the lost ad revenue. So yeah, great point. Um, so uh, I'd say like maybe only 1 in 20 successful streamers runs adverts. 1 in 10, 1 in 20, 1 in 30, something like that. Anyway, so the, um, the main way that Twitch streamers earn money, like I say, is to just get, is to get viewers to just give them money for what they bought us. Um, and a key part of this is what's called subscribing, which is where you agree to give a streamer 5 10 or $25 every month until you switch it off. And in exchange for this, you get a little icon next to your name. And streamers are very good at this, in that the icons by your name, if you are sub, is different for every single channel. And streamers will make their own little icons like these. So this one was a Pokemon uh, channel, and so this streamer had built sub, -i -sub uh, icons, which all look like Pokemon uh, creatures. And this one was a uh, Metroid channel, I think, and so all of these were built to look like items from the Metroid series of games. And so part of the branding is creating a set of I icons which are appropriate to your stream and which your viewers want to have. And then um, these are some uh, quotes from streamers and part of what encourages viewers to sub to someone's channel is that the streamer will do, will do things with subs which, which, they, which they don't do with the average uh, viewer. So they might have a private Discord channel which only people who give the money can chat with them on. Or they might say, the next five people to sub, I will play with you in the next game of League of Legends, which I play, and so on. And so then people will give money, since they want to play a game live with the uh, streamer. And on this point, I'll come back to it in a bit, but uh, streamers also kind of offer services to viewers who give them money, such as let letting them choose what uh, game they play or what piece of music plays in the background and so on. And this final, final quote I think is quite nice from a pro streamer saying that the way that their goal in trying to get viewers to give them money was just to give their viewers a good experience and let them have fun with it. But here is, but it here is giving them money. And so the idea that they are almost kind of, kind of doing a service to the viewer by letting them have fun giving them money is this kind of intriguing uh, framing which lots of Twitch streamers seem to have. And also lots of streamers will use the platform to kind of build in extra ways of making money. And one of, and one of these is to have kind of is to have kind of running goals where they'll say my goal for this stream is to make 500 bucks and when someone gives money then this little kind of counter will tick upwards. Um, and other streamers will do things where if you give X money, they will do Y. So they will do a dance, or they'll change the music, or they will 
Um, some streamers I've seen have a world map on the back of their bedroom wall, and if you give them money, they will put a pin in that map where you live, and so you then kind of feel feel like you're part of the stream and you've contributed to the streamer, and so on. And some also do this thing where they will basically run raffles or lotteries on their streams. I should stress this is monstrously against the law in pretty much every country on earth. But streamers do this, and they will say, you know, um, if you give me ten bucks in the next week, one of you will win a PS4 or something. Um, and when there are two million channels and so much content, no one can really police this stuff at this point. But but uh, streamers do this and make quite a bit of money from that. And also, like I say, there some will frame this as viewers are expected to compete to give them the most money that they can in one day. And they will frame this as a two days top donor thing on their stream. And so viewers will then compete to have their name put their their name put up there. And like and like it says there, um, some will use the 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 kind the kind letter D to mean two fairly distinct things, but to conflate the idea that the um, that the volume of money a a male viewer can give kind of equates to their masculinity in some sense, and male viewers basically fall into this and will do this and will compete to give the most money in one session to a female streamer. Make of that what you will. So, uh, also, lots of streamers have found ways to use the very open platform which Twitch is and the Twitch a uh, API to do things like build entire games into their broadcasts. So, one of the most well played is this thing, where um, a viewer who gives money be, will become the boss of that channel, and then when other viewers give money, the money deals damage to that viewer. And if you deal the final blow, then you become the new boss, and your name goes on stream. If you play games, what the the thing I've just said will make a lot more sense. But it's basically a way of getting viewers again to compete to give the streamer more money by building these kind of uh, add-ons into specific Twitch uh, channels. And then other uh, streamers have gone further, and one streamer has done this really. Um, extreme thing where they built an entire text adventure game in their Twitch chat window which you can play only by leaving things for them to read in Twitch chat and once viewers start to do this much like when you sub um, the longer you stay as a sub the better and better your little icon becomes and so you are inclined then to to stay in one channel here as soon as people start to to play this text adventure game embedded in the chat window, they tend to stick around because they are engaged and kind of committed in some sense to playing through that game. So, sum up all of this wackiness. Um, all of these are both using the platform itself and viewers being kind of entrepreneurial and finding new ways to use the openness of Twitch as a site to make money. And all of these ways of making money are built to further the extent to which a viewer wants to keep watching a certain given channel. In that once a viewer gives money, they become less and less inclined, the more money they give, to watch anyone else's channel. Therefore, if a streamer can encourage the viewers to give money, they don't just make money then, they also kind of capture a viewer who will stay with them and who might then also give more money into the future. And some, as in this picture, will host these kinds of events, I guess, called subathons, where excuse me, where streamers will compete to get as many subscribers as they can in, in one session, and they will kind of encourage their viewers to help them beat other streamers who are also trying to do this, and the viewers who are loyal to that streamer will indeed give money and help them do this. And so all of these sorts, sorts of things build the sense of both community and the friendship between the streamer and the viewer by kind of, by, by kind of tying them even more uh, strongly into their channel. So last of all, I'd just like to kind of briefly think, where is this all going? So most of the pro streamers who I speak with stress that, that they feel Twitch and the kind of 
non-professional live streaming of content is changing the, the world. And this quote uh, for an STS crowd I think is especially good. Um, this was a pro streamer. This was someone who had uh, he'd gone to higher ed I think three times and dropped out three times. He'd been unemployed for six years and now makes about a quarter of a million dollars per year on Twitch. And when I asked him kind of how do you see this in a broader sense, he said this thing, it's like the laying down of the first telephone lines, and Twitch is just fundamentally changing how we make and consume media content. I should also add here that um, there, there is content on Twitch which, which is not gaming content, maybe like the 1% or 0.1 or so, which is things like people making art or making music or recording podcasts or doing paintings or making costumes or glass blowing or making chain mail, all kinds of weird stuff. There are two people on Twitch who make a full time income from people watching them make chain mail and the people who watch them give them money because they really enjoy watching them make chain mail. Um, but broadly speaking, Twitch, Twitch is still a game site for, nine, for, not for, for 99 plus of the people who watch it. Um, and here there's this kind of framing that, that the games sector, which is what drove Twitch and which is what still drives Twitch, is at the kind of leading edge of tech as a whole. Um, and also here, kind of streamers, in that we tend to think of games as wastes of time in some sense, streamers work hard to build this sense that all the hours they spent as a child and as a, and as a, and as a teen playing games have now paid off since they have a pro streaming uh, job and so on. But even those who are right at the top of this space are still kind of concerned about where it might go. So all the pro streamers who I've talked with stress that they know they are not employed by Twitch at all. So, so if Twitch closes, then they just lose their jobs their jobs, or if Twitch just chooses to ban someone, they are, they, they are not employed by Twitch, so Twitch can just ban whoever they want, um, and so lots are quite kind of fearful of where this might go, and of having all of their income shaped on this one platform, where all of the power is still with the platform holders, and so lots uh, say that they plan to retire soon and move on to doing some other thing. But there's this, there's this kind of intriguing thing which they say, where they say that, like, uh, so, one, uh, so one guy who I talked with said he planned to retire in four years' time, but he said, I will not tell my fans that until the day I leave. And I said, hmm, okay, why is that? And he said, because if I tell them now, they will start to leave, they will stop giving me money, they will stop subscribing to me, and they will and they will stop kind of contributing to the culture and the money which I built here if I tell them I will leave, and that's kind of intriguing if we compare that to say TV, in that if someone said a, a TV show would only have four more seasons, no one would quit watching now when there's only four whole seasons left, and yet here Twitch viewers. If someone would quit in four years' time, they will just start to leave that channel in droves. And so Twitch viewers, in some sense, feel almost entitled to basically endless content. And if you, and if you cease to promise that, then your Twitch stream will go downhill quickly. So, and I really like this gif from someone who often streams as Spider-Man. Where does all this weird mayhem uh, leave us? So I think the kind of crucial point here is that when we ask why do people watch Twitch rather than TV or film and so on, that there's four big points. And the first is one that you can talk directly to big names, to famous people, and they will talk back to you, and you can build up this sense that you know them and they know you and so on. And no other media form offers the same kind of thing and for such a large crowd of uh, viewers at the same time. And then the next point is that everyone who watches a certain channel, you can broadly assume that, that at least when it comes to their tastes in games or their, or their tastes in kind of geek culture as a whole, are going to be broadly like yours in some sense. So it's a space to hang out with like-minded people. Also, uh, for, for those who watch, you can gain 
social status in in a very kind of crowded, a very populated, a very competitive online space by either giving money or by doing things to help to help out a streamer in some other sense. And also, like I say, you can learn a lot about games and the game sector by viewing Twitch, which you can't watch uh, to the same extent on YouTube or on other platforms. And for lots of uh, viewers, Twitch is, is now partly or fully replacing their viewing of TV and film. Um, and for all of these sorts, sorts of people, and like I say, if we view Twitch as being a TV channel, it would be the fourth or fifth most watched on Earth, I think. Um, this is really changing how these sorts of, how these sorts of people consume media content. And also, I should add, to go back to the adv adv advertising point, um, lots of these are people who are hard to reach through TV ads and film trailers and so on, and so Twitch is now a site for marketing companies to reach a crowd who tend not to watch live TV, who tend to use ad block and things of this sort, Twitch is somewhere where you can still reach them with your games or your products or things of this sort. So that's pretty much everything I have to say. This is my shameless plug slide. I've written a huge amount on Twitch, so if you're keen, please do give it a look. And thank you all for listening. Thanks, Mark. What a world. Um, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds just to form a question up, so there is like a micro moment if you want to go grab the top up and read it. That's 30 seconds. So, questions, please. I'm going to start with Nelly, she's... I've got a Twitch. <laughs> um, so, I, I kind of want to challenge your claim of novelty in this case. Because I kind of have heard most of these things, or I'm going to reveal too much about my own taste in the media now. So, first of all, what if you come from the ASMR community, mm. yes, which yes. is making money out of people doing, people watching, people doing weird things. Mm. So, I like the one about following the towers myself. Mm. But, you know, so people, people, having over money to watch people doing things which you don't expect people to pay money to do. Um, secondly, I mean the whole giving money to be part of a community, QVC and the shopping channels, if you've ever seen oh, yeah, those. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't think it's quite the same giving money because they're clearly buying stuff, but people are buying stuff they don't want in order to be part of a community and in order to raise their status in the community. And going further back in time than that, I think this sounds very similar, apart from the, the kind of aim point of everlasting redemption, but it sounds like organised religion <laughs> and the way that, that the church has been funded for a very long time. So, yeah. what really is an novelty and why do we care about it? Great points, thank you. Yeah, um, I think all of those things are true, without a doubt. Um, I think the, the combination of aspects, I think, is new here. Although many aspects, like you say, are found elsewhere in the past and in uh, reading here and in more kind of modern times too. But I think the liveness is one of the absolutely crucial points. Like for uh, ASMR groups on YouTube and so on, in general, in general, that's not live. And in, and in general, you aren't talking with the person who, like you say, is scratching a board or folding towels and so on. Um, so I think the liveness, I think, is crucial to making sense of why people grab here, what they enjoy viewing, what the appeal is compared to other things, and how the exact specifics of the platform are making it so successful for these sorts of spaces compared to YouTube. In the clearly YouTube as a whole produces far more content than Twitch, like by a mile. But uh, in but in terms of the closeness of communities on these two sites, I think if we look at the work of people or people like um, Hector Post to go and so on on, uh, on YouTube, I think the communities which form there, I realise that there's no kind of hard and fast way to how to say how tightly knit, knit a, a, a group of people is, but broadly speaking, my sense is that Twitch viewers feel more tightly bound to their Twitch channels than YouTube viewers do, do to theirs. Um, and also I think that, that the communication back and forth is also Sort of crucial here. Again, I think that kind of fill that filters through labour and through money and through the platform and through all of these things. Um, so I completely agree that there are definitely big kind of 
predecessors to this sort of system, and clearly both Twitch as a platform and the, and the streamers who who built their own ways to do well on it have definitely taken advantage of these. But I do think the particular set of things we see here is still is is quite new as well. Yeah, mine probably, mine is sort of preemptively because of all the way through I was thinking of televangelism. Yeah. Um, okay. But, but it's, I, I think, you know, you can argue about is it new or is it not new or what makes it new. It, it, it's more a point of saying maybe there are some, in trying to understand how these people are making meaning in this world, yeah, yeah. then there's probably quite a lot in the sociology of religion mm. that, that you probably might want to draw on mm. to sort of think about you know, how people are constructing their identities, making meaning, mm. making sense of the world through the, through this activity, yeah. rather than say, is it new, is it not new, mm. because you'll find some things that are not. Yeah. Yes, yes, um, thank you for that uh, thought. I think kind of when that, it's interesting in that frame to look at the role of religion, religion on Twitch, mm. in that there are, almost, there are almost no Twitch streamers who will ever discuss religion at all on Twitch. They will talk to health and whether they're left wing or right or right wing, they will talk about who they vote for, they'll talk about their party lives, but almost no one talks religion on Twitch. Mm. And the few streamers who I asked about this topic, although they wouldn't frame it in the kind of same framing that we might when we talk about these sorts of things, they definitely framed it as kind of that they were quite wary of religious techniques and of religious sort of forms of persuasion or forms of behaviour that they specifically wanted to avoid in their broadcasts on Twitch. So I agree, I think it would be intriguing to to see how those stand up, shall we say. <laughs> Sorry, just to write it. Do they talk about religion in the games? It's a it, fantasy uh, game. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, only if it's a fictional aspect of the game that they are playing, yeah. yeah. Next, please, but I've got Alex Dublin. Um, oh, sorry, Ed. Um, thanks a lot for that. That was really interesting. What my uh, so I was thinking it was interesting to hear about the way like authenticity was constructed of the streamer, and I'm interesting interested to hear more about the authenticity of the of the viewers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking back to it was a few years ago about a lot of major labels got in trouble because they were uh, by purchasing mm -hmm. views and streams yes. and comments on various videos for the artists that they represented. And I was wondering whether there is a sort of issue of streamers kind of trying to create donations, things that look mm -hmm. like donations, mm -hmm. like manufacture an audience, like is the audience authentic? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to hear a bit more about that. And also of the actual authentic part of the audience is this is maybe a difficult question given the data you've got. I don't know. But like where, you know, do they tend to be in certain parts of the world mm -hmm. where who do, who are they composed of? Um, so that's, and then I did have another short question, which is, I was curious to hear more about the relationship between the Twitch moderators mm -hmm. and the channel moderators. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, you know, because I'd imagine the Twitch moderators are more interested in implementing like a board policy yeah. as opposed to the channel ones. Great question. So the first one was authenticity of viewers. Second is due is is kind of where where do viewers live. And yeah. third on channel ones versus yeah. a lot more sure. So um, on the authenticity of viewers, some people have been caught out using fake viewers uh, and viewer botting. That's found on pretty high, pretty uh, strongly, of course. But a few people do it. But in general, there seems to be there have been reports of this kind of thank you of this kind of roving groups of viewer bots who no one's sure who they control. And they just drift in and out of channels, and no one's quite sure why. Um, and this this has been a thing for kind of two for two or three years, I guess, uh, on Twitch, where someone who is quite new to Twitch and who, when they stream, they get say twenty to thirty viewers for a whole week. They'll go up to five hundred, and then back down to twenty or thirty. And they claim that they didn't pay for this. And if we assume that that's true, then, which seems to be the case in that a huge number of Twitch streamers all seem to agree on Twitter and so on who, who made these bots and why do they come through and so on. Some people have accused Twitch 
of creating bots on their own platform to boost numbers, but I think that's highly doubtful. And that's just screams of donations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've never seen the the only kind of inauthentic donation are people who back when you had to donate via PayPal rather than by Twitch itself, you could do that. You you could do a um, a claim back once you once you place the donation in, and so some people would basically troll the streamer by donating ten thousand dollars, and the streamer would go, "Oh my God, that's amazing! Thank you." And then they claim it back, and then they wouldn't get the money. One person, this did backfire for someone, when someone do donated $50,000 as a troll donation, and then PayPal upheld the donation. There we go, so that's $50,000 gone to that streamer. Um, so that's the only kind of inauthentic do in, in, that, in this yeah. sense. A donation which I've ever heard of, I've never heard of Twitch streamers faking donations and viewers. I've never heard of outside of these kind of roving groups yeah. of, view of, of viewer bots who streamers claim to not use. And my research suggests they're probably telling the truth there, and so I'm not sure what exactly these things are, who made them, and why. But yeah, I think broadly speaking, viewers are pretty authentic, I think. And the donations which come in tend to be real as well. Yeah. Then on the geography point, um, everywhere on one level, I mean, you clearly, you clearly have to have a connection fast enough to like, video, of course, which rules out some parts of the world. But uh, in parts of the world where you do have access to that kind of internet connection, uh, pretty widespread. Um, most Twitch viewers are from the US, or from Western Europe, or from East Asia. Um, but outside of that, there's a large Russian community on Twitch, there's a large South American community on Twitch, and there's a large North African one as well. Um, so pretty diverse. But viewers of it are very hard to research compared to the streamers when there's so many of them and all you have is a username, as in there's no profile, there's no age, name, where they're based on, it's just a name. Uh, so viewers are pretty hard to research and Twitch is also semi-reluctant, I think, for people to research viewers because um, a while back they released something like 5 billion chat logs, which is the, the chat from like two days worth of chat or something. And someone did some kind of big data study of these chat logs and found the 10 most used words were, words were all slurs. And so Twitch don't really like people to realize that most of their viewers are basically dickheads who say horrible <laughs> things. And so in this regard, it's kind of tricky to research viewers. Then the third point, what was your third question? That was the difference between Twitch mods and... Thank you, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the uh, broad, the site mods are paid by Twitch and they basically have mod powers in every channel. Um, they, they basically just, if someone says something nasty, then they'll ban that, ban that person. But in general, they also have a, have a kind of implicit role where they're expected to generally sort of check that communities as a whole are being friendly. There was, there was, a, there was a bit of controversy a while, a while back for, for some of the alt-right streams where Twitch's employed mods were displeased by what they saw in those streams, but 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 everything everything they saw in those streams was still allowed by Twitch's terms of service and was allowed by the channel owner, and so it got into this kind of weird thing of who has the, who whose authority do do we choose here to remove this fairly kind of hate, hateful content, um, but yeah, whereas for mods there's you know ten million mods or something on Twitch. For Twitch-wide mods, there's a couple hundred, I think, or a hundred or something like that. So if you see one, everyone in Twitch chat goes wild, because it's so rare to see a global mod uh, in chat. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I just wanted to propose a different way of dealing with the what's special about Twitch question, mm -hmm. which is to say there's absolutely nothing special about mm -hmm. Twitch. Um, what's special, and therefore what we can use it for, is to find what does it mean to have a job in the early 21st yes. century. Absolutely. Because every single one of the things you listed that they do on a daily basis, I do mm. to try and manage my uh, audience. Right? Yes. Uh, I might do it in different ways, but I'm modding all the time, and I'm mm. you know, bumping various people. You know, I've got reviewers who are you know, doing things for me for free. You know? mm. Twitch is a is a pot of mm. what does it mean to have a job today? I completely agree. Yeah. So that's immediately makes it, the whole thing come more alive. So, for instance, the idea that this is Twitch is propping up health services mm. in countries, right? Yeah, yeah. Twitch, and the other day people were reporting on, um, in America, insurance companies, including in their letters of 
denial mm -hmm. or, or what you need to do in order to do the banking process would be to crowdfund X, Y, Z amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. Twitch is the way of getting in there ahead of time, mm -hmm. getting there first and seeing what's going on. Um, and then my question would be, in lurking in the background of your mm -hmm. talk, seems to be, aside from the actors perhaps who are the authenticity, mm -hmm. you seem to have your own. Mm -hmm. And that was coming through as well in the last two questions. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you feel that no, um, I answer that one in a second. On the comment, I completely agree that a lot of people are that a huge volume of the work which goes on on Twitch goes on outside of Twitch, of course, in lots of cases. And lots of the papers which which I've done on Twitch do take that kind of angle of yes, this is its own intriguing thing, but it also shows just like what does what does labour look like for young people today in a broad sense. Um, as for the authenticity. <coughs> question. Um, could you elaborate on that? Yes, so it, I mean, I might just be too prickly in order to remember, right? So you maybe you weren't saying the thing, because I felt what you were saying. But mm. it seems to be like, there was the times when your um, interlocutors were talking about authenticity, mm. fair news, right? But then you seem to always uh, have a caveat when you were making your own claims about authenticity. Mm. So a sense of authenticity. Mm. Or um, oh, right, the, right, okay. the, the you know, Inculcating identity. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be suspicious about this activity. Or is it actual perhaps you're okay, finding yeah. people being people? This Good is point. A, yeah. this is a I definitely system. wasn't meaning to buy anything suspicious. More more kind of healthy doubt about what sorts of social structures we're seeing emerging. Uh, and I think that, 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 that there's a lot of cases where having talked to viewers, although this is a far small part of this uh, part of this project that I think a lot of viewers have, uh, by their own admission, or by asking streamers what they think about their viewers, or asking viewers what they think about the streamers who they watch, lots of actors in this space recognize that there's a certain, how can I put it, lots of actors in this space are, are surprisingly critical about, about what they are doing, and about what other actors are doing, and about what we are seeing emerging here. Uh, and there's a real sense that there, there is a certain kind of ephemerality, maybe, about what we see on Twitch. And viewers and streamers are like, share, share this. And so I suppose I was more, A, using those sorts of terms to acknowledge that, that there's a million meanings of the term culture, say, or something. But also that even those within these sites are surprisingly, re are surprisingly ref Reflexive when it comes to what they do and whatever else in this site does. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was hoping to follow up on a few things you said. Um, I was wondering, when you said that about cam girls and that, and mm. it's not being that, I was wondering to say what, why that's not allowed, mm. what they think it is instead. Mm. And also, when you said at the end that they see this as being something new, I was wondering, what is the exchange value? Sure. In this? Go. Or is it just cash? Yeah. Okay, so on yeah um, on the first point, so Twitch uh, Twitch are very strict on what you can and can't stream. Uh, when when it comes to the material content of what you can and can't stream, and this wasn't the case until say two or three years back, but now they have this giant this giant this huge page of what you can and of what you of what you can and can't stream and how you can and can't look when you stream as well. Uh, so this so this says things like you can broadcast brewing, you can't broadcast distilling. Or it says. Does that include the content of games as well? Well, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah. And um, also that uh, in that games which have overt sexual content in them, you can't broadcast. Um, and one example is there's a well-known game dev who works at uh, NYU called called what called Robert Yang, who makes these sort of suggestive gay male sex games where you never see anything on camera, but it's very very suggestive. And those are banned from Twitch, even though nothing. Is shown on screen, and that's interesting. But um, but yes, yeah, so Twitch has strict has strict rules rules on this stuff. And when it comes to the cam girl stuff, it became apparent a few years back that um, quite a lot of young women who make money on cam girl sites had shifted over to Twitch, as they felt rightly, I think, that that they could access kind of a new crowd of potential viewers on Twitch, um, and Twitch. Like I said, they never they never explicitly said that that this was why they really clamped down on how you present on stream. But
But every streamer who I've talked to tends to think this is why, and for my own research, I also think that think that think that think that this is why. Um, and they were very keen to kind of move live streaming away from something with potential erotic content to something far more uh, neutral, I think. And that, I think, is what was behind Twitch's choice. Does that kind of answer your question, or why you're seeing something very different? Well, I just want to look what, I mean, what they see as being wrong with that. Uh, sort of why oh, right. They, why they want it to be so, like, yeah. on hand outside. Twitch, why yeah. Happens. Right, so I got, got it. Uh, Twitch see themselves wrongly, I think, at least in part, as a family site. Not a lot, which is interesting for many different reasons. Um, or rather, they or rather they see themselves as a potentially family-friendly site. At least, let's say that. Uh, which is wrong, given that all the most used words are slurs. Every streamer swears profusely, and most of the games involve you shooting someone in the head until their head explodes. So when you factor in these two aspects, I'm not sure how family-friendly Twitch really is. But Twitch see themselves as being something where you should be able to have streams that teen that teens and children can watch. And therefore, not with any kind of uh, sexual, con sexual content. Um, but also, I think, like I say, they want to separate themselves and mark out what live streaming could be outside of Camgirls as well. Um, and I also think that their broader issue is potential controversies, basically. That if they allow more suggestive content, and then someone's kid is watching a Minecraft stream, and they go to another stream and it's sexy in some way, then they could get sued, or something of that sort. So I think that they're concerned about that. What was your second question again? Um, is it when they said that this is the current name that's had a problem with the time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the thing that's new for that? <laughs> Sorry? So what's new for that? For, for the streamers or yeah. the viewers? Oh, for the streamers, so what right. they see is being this new thing that's happening. Yeah, I think, I think they, they see the proximity between the media producer and the media consumer as being the thing. Um, which, uh, which, like we just said, in some ways I think is true, but in some ways it's also not true as well, and there have been proto-Twitch, proto-livestreaming things too. But for them, it's the proximity to people all around the globe that they talk to you and you talk back with in seconds, and yet you are also at the same time doing this very kind of slick, professionalised broadcast also. And I think for them, it's that. But, but also a lot of streamers talk about the newness of the particular kinds of communities which of which uh, which arise on Twitch, and to return to your question, uh, Andy, your question, uh, I'm not sure to what extent the kind the kinds of communities on Twitch are that new. Actually, they're kind of new, but also kind of not in other ways. I think, but I think that there's a very kind of a very deliberate self framing of the site as being super new, and this is all groundbreaking and so on, as a way to justify, in most cases, to their parents why their job is playing video games on the internet. <laughs> and just a final point on that, on the list of things which you can and can't stream, Twitch also say you cannot stream a live broadcast of an unattended printer. So clearly someone, someone once did this, and then Twitch saw it and went, no way. And now they explicitly say you cannot broadcast a video on a printer just printing things. Well, exactly. <laughs> 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 well, I don't think so. No, that's, where, that's where my frustration is. Because your title is Why Do People Watch? And from your talk, I got why I should get into become a Twitch streamer. Right? Mm -hmm. that, you, you convinced me for that. So, lucrative <laughs> <laughs> my Twitch. Yeah. Exactly. So, and I want to hear a bit more than it makes them belong part of a community mm -hmm. that they can interact directly with. And I'm just not convinced that that's what makes it special, and perhaps it's not it's not special at all. Okay, yeah. I guess that there's one thing I would add, which in other talks I have said, but there's only so many slides I can come into talk. But um, I guess one more thing I would add is the watching of someone who's skilled at something. That for some viewers, there's something like watching a great sports person or, or a great piece of music being played live. For some people who watch who watch streamers who are more focused on the on the broadcaster's skill, a lot of viewers are there to watch a skilled gamer. But since since most Twitch streamers are no more or less skilled than the average Twitch gamer, that's only say one percent of viewers these days, which is why I didn't foreground it here. But for some for some viewers, I think the specificity of watching someone highly skilled at a game which they also play 
is a big part of it. Um, and I think also, again, no space here, but I think also for games where there are a thousand paths, I think there's also an enjoyment of seeing someone explore a different path, but in a world which you know. I think that there's also something there. That's um, certainly why yeah. I watch right? Sorry? That's, uh, that's certainly why I watch right. them. I don't watch Dutch, I watch them on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I watch them because they are much better than me. Yeah. Or they have a funny take on the whole storyline. Yeah. That's yeah. why I watch it. And I think that's the more interesting thing than yeah, yeah. To I, me. Yeah. I, I think kind of, at least from all from the research which I've done, my, my sense is overwhelmingly that those reasons are increasingly being pushed out on Twitch. That there are a growing number, well, most, is my sense, most Twitch viewers, maybe they began because they are a League of Legends player and they wanted to watch someone who's super skilled at League and so on. But now it's just turned into they just watch them because they are mod and they've been a sub for 10 months and they enjoy watching their channel and they enjoy talk, talking with them and so on. Um, again, when there's so many viewers, it's hard to research this kind of thing. But overwhelmingly from the from from the non-modded viewers, from the mod viewers and from the streamers who who I've talked with, and the channels which I've watched and, and have seen what viewers have to say about the content which they're watching, my sense is overwhelmingly for 90% plus of Twitch channels, the game is just it's not incidental, but it's it's the initial hook. It's not the thing which gives which keeps you all there. So so I guess in some sense I could add the word keep to the title of this talk. I, why do people keep watching uh, people rather than coming up first? And although I agree that there are lots of people who do still watch for those reasons, my definite sense is that, is that as a percentage, that is shrinking, 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 as the community reasons grow. Is the sense I get to this? So you expect them, wouldn't you? Sorry, Brett, just quick. Tiny follow up. Yeah, you expect them to imagine themselves in opposition to esports, wouldn't you? Do they um, talk about A lot do. A lot do. E a lot pride themselves on being kind of crappy at games. Right. Um, and they pride themselves on, like, one extreme streamer who I watch, he's a variety <coughs> streamer, so he, so he plays all sorts of games. And he's crap at all. And he basically, <coughs> I'd say roughly three quarters of all of his broadcasts are just talking to people in chat. And only one quarter is playing the game. And sometimes you do, you, do, you do get people in his chat saying, do you think you could play the game at some point, perhaps? And so they are clearly people like you're talking um, over here that they have come on to view the unique nature of the game or the, uh, or the person playing that game. But this is one of the most successful streamers on Twitch who spends very little time playing the games which he plays and most times just saying thanks for the money, thanks for joining, hey how's your sister, mother, brother, etc. Um, and I think extreme, and, uh, and that's not a rare case at all. That balance be between talking to streamers slash talking to viewers versus being there for the game I don't think is rare. Uh, these days at all, but at the same time we can't exclude all the esports streams where part of the appeal is the game, but like I said, I think 90% plus of Twitch viewers are there for, for the aspects where the game is semi-incidental. Sorry, it's okay. So, Daniel made a new unrememberable, unrememberable of essay slide. Um, uh, you gave the impression, perhaps I misheard you, that there was less racist, sexist, transphobic um, mm. bigotry in the interactions online, you know, that you could present as a black person or a woman, you know, without getting abused. Is that true? And if it is true, are there any lessons we can learn from this context which might be applicable in other online contexts where this stuff is really bad? Great right. question. I think the crucial thing is that the channel owner basically has total control over their channel. I think for me that that is the total crux. Is it true that there's less of this bad stuff than in you know, channels yeah. which care about it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, in channel in channels which care, they will they will say write a custom script so that any variation of a word which they don't like prior to the message even appearing is caught, flagged, and the message just doesn't even come up, and the person is banned straight up. Also, because these channels tend to be safe spaces for particular groups. These are channels where viewers are even more inclined to help out the streamer by keeping the channel nice and friendly and not full of slurs and so on. Um, and so you get a lot of cases where 
they do these sorts of things and they they what's the word they parcel out some of the work of keeping these channels nice to their view to their uh, viewers and so on. <clears throat> but I'd say in channels this there's also a trend here with the size of channels. So the bigger a channel is, the easier something nasty can be missed in Twitch chat as it shoots upwards. Uh, and so in huge channels of say 100,000 viewers, if you watch chat, almost every snapshot of chat has some racist or sexist or whatever slur in it, because people who are posting those know the chat moves too fast for it to be caught. So you do get that as well. Um, but broadly speaking, I'd say in spaces which care on Twitch, I think it is surprisingly good compared to most other online spaces because of how open the platform is, how much you, how much you can control your own channel's chat, and because of how, how inclined viewers are to help you out as well. So can we learn from this? This sounds like the best news I've heard about online spaces <laughs> in, in months. You know? Yeah, yeah. Can it be generalized? You know, I so think, much shit yeah. out there. You know? I think it does. Like very few, very few online spaces in lots of ways give people who aren't employed by that space so much control over that space, right? And so I think it's hard to see how this could be done as a for on the forum. I mean, clearly on some level, mods on a sub forum serve a similar goal, but a sub forum is a much bigger thing in most cases than a Twitch channel. So I think so I think finding platforms where you can give trusted people control over some part of that platform and you can somehow incentivize other people who have the same interests and motivations to do the same there. It's tricky. I don't think it's impossible, um, but I think it is tricky because the particular mix of content and money and friendship and intimacy and channel control is so particular on this side. I t I'm not doubting the idea, if this changed in five years, feel free to tell me I was wrong, but right now I think that's a very unique mix. I think I struggled to see how we could shift that onto, you know, Facebook or something. I think it's tricky to see. Yeah. I've got Frank and John who've been patiently waiting for ages, and there's a blood of blizzard of lots of good questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So Frank, yeah, that's so all good. You've been, you've been talking about Twitch as this sort of thing out there. Now I've just checked that well-known academic source Wikipedia, mm. uh, which tells me that Twitch is owned by Amazon, mm. which. which Starts ringing all sorts of alarm bells it does, yes. straight straight away. So, could you say something about how Twitch, as a platform, actually works? I mean, apart from the owner, what sort of, how do they monetize it? Um, yeah. How do how do they pay? How does Amazon profit from it? I mean, I think yeah. uh, those are sort of really quite curious curious questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, Twitch may profit partly through ads on channels which which they turn on, off, said. on channels where they're turned on. Twitch makes some uh, some uh, money from that, but most of Twitch's money is when you subscribe. Roughly half goes to Twitch, half goes to the streamer. I said, the streamers guys, you've got to sort of pay Twitch for the privilege of doing doing this. Streamers don't directly pay Twitch anything. You can stream for free. We could go on Twitch now and just stream, um, but. If, if one was so inclined. Um, but whenever you subscribe to a streamer, Twitch takes some of that money and some goes to the streamer. The more successful a streamer is, the more that balance gets tilted towards the streamer. So I believe the new streamer who gets people to subscribe, it's roughly 50-50. But, excuse me, I think a big streamer is more like 70-30 in the streamer's phase. Uh, when you donate, one of the issues was that in the old days you had to donate by PayPal and Twitch couldn't capture that. Once Amazon bought them, however, they introduced a currency on their site called Bits, and you now buy Bits and you, and you donate by Bits, and there's a markup of like 10% or something when you buy Bits, um, a little bit of that goes into Twitch. So hang on, you can't, you can't sort of give your Visa number to, to this? To the, the streamer? Channel, to the channel streamer. You would give your Visa number to Twitch, you buy a bunch of currency which only works on Twitch, and then you use that to donate to streamers. Also, I might add, the more bits you give at once, the nicer a little graphic that plays, and so you are, of course, inclined to then buy more bits and give more money, because then you get a nicer little graphic, and then the streamer is more likely to see your little graphic and go, oh, thank you so much for the 10,000 bits and so on. So if I was a streamer, I would try and set up a separate account, which, which money can be channeled without going from Twitch. You can still get people to give you money by PayPal, but Twitch have built cheering into the platform and into your Amazon account as well. You can buy directly with that now. 
so and because you can, you can only get kind of pretty little graphics when you donate via Twitch, and people on Twitch really like pretty little graphics when they give money, people are strongly inclined to, to cheer rather than to use PayPal. And I'd say now, two years on, truly 99% plus of all donations are through Twitch rather than through PayPal now. Twitch has been very, so Twitch slash Jeff Bezos have been very successful in making that happen. It reminds me of Pussy Trader. <laughs> I'm definitely following Frank when he starts screaming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John, can you do this under pressure of time? Yeah, I can. But, um, first of all, thank you for making sense of my son. Second, excuse me, he spends all his time on the show. Okay, now I will now be out of conversation. <laughs> a brief one. <laughs> so, we we'll donate any of those bits. <laughs> yeah. um, so my, my question is, is, is why doesn't this actually spread? Mm. So, I guess it needs, these, I guess it needs some sort of background which is continuous mm. and sort of streaming. Mm. Um, but there are other things that you could potentially stream. Yeah. You could imagine. I mean, you could have a, you'd have a constant Brexit. Why isn't there a politics to it? Mean, yeah. There is some, but is there a know, less than 1% is, is yeah. there seems to be people obviously had this idea before, yeah. it hasn't flown. Yeah. So there must be something yeah. that goes. Nature is another one. You, you mm. can imagine a, a, a street. Actual, it's so meta, why do you stream that stream? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Yeah, why 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 so one, one is that I think other platforms are more associated already with streaming non-games content, I think is one thing. Like Facebook uh, streams a lot of politics content, and lots of uh, newspaper pages and so on will live stream stuff. Um, so although Facebook's live streaming is, is watched by a fraction of what Twitch is, it's still, I think, Twitch is more associated with, maybe more, uh, Facebook, sorry, is more associated with more serious streaming topics to some extent. Um, also, I think the non-Twitch platforms, there's this intriguing thing which happens, which is playing a game in your bedroom is a very kind of contained space, right? Yes, you could die streaming your games, but it's pretty unlikely in the grand scheme of things. However, there have been lots of cases of, of people dying on live streams. On Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, there have been cases of people who live stream being shot, being stabbed, falling from things, these sorts of things. And these, I think, have become not a big part of the kind of cultural thinking around these spaces, but a decent part of it. And um, on the part of those who run these spaces, uh, from how from, from I've been kind of talked with a few of them a bit, the sense I get is that there's a lot of fear of basically, if you let people live stream anything, people are going to live stream horrible, horrible things consistently. And I think that there's a real reluctance to put lots of money and effort behind streaming, streaming, streaming platforms for other topics. Does the Twitch police it? Does it try and say so yeah. if you're not doing gaming stuff? Okay. If you're not doing gaming, you either have to do Twitch Creative, which is for art and music and yeah. stuff, or do Twitch IRL, which is for in real life, in which case you are streaming yourself eating food or something. But even <laughs> that, and and like peop and people make full time incomes by broadcasting themselves eating food. I'd just like to stress this point. Um, but these are still tiny, tiny slivers, and e and Twitch are. I don't know to what, to what extent IRL will continue because there's a kind of consent issue that if someone just walks past you in the crowd, then they've been recorded and broadcast to those people and you didn't consent to that. And of course, live TV gets around that in certain ways, but I, I don't think that there's yet a body of law to deal with that for for live streamers rather than for kind of for professional TV companies. So to sum all that up, I think it boils down to one: other platforms associated with non-game streaming. Two, even though those platforms are associated with that, they are cautious about going further and building their live streaming thing because of the dangers of broadcasting anything more risky than playing games or making art or playing your gun kit or something. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, well, I, I mean, in the context of 72 hour continuous block <laughs> streaming yeah. fired up on amphetamines, this was very brief. But we're still <laughs> slightly over time. So, will you join me in thanking Mark? Thanks, everyone. Um, we are heading to the Hudson Room for a quick